rise and enter our inner world and offer ourselves some solitude. There's something very beautiful, I think, about being alone yet connected to others. True solitude is very different from loneliness. It's often based on a sense of harmony with the outside world. So just recognizing how it feels to come more fully into the body. Noticing the shape of the body, the position that you've chosen to sit in. And often we choose this position almost by default, without taking a lot of care, sometimes sitting in a position that's worked before, but doesn't necessarily work every time, so just check doing a gentle body scan through the body to see if there's anything you can adjust, loosen up, release, perhaps stretch the back or roll the shoulders. Just to give yourself a sense of ease and comfort whilst remaining alert. Recognizing what you've left behind, the busyness of the day. Perhaps a conversation you just had or a meal. The visual impressions that have disappeared now your eyes are closed. And how delightful it is to just come into the present moment. Recognizing that by offering yourself this present moment, you're giving yourself a gift of self-care. So just see if you can connect with a sense of appreciation for yourself. that you're aligning your life with your values. And allowing that to bring some gladness to the heart, to the mind. And also perhaps recognizing something that you feel grateful for. It could be something that happened today. Or the general blessings of your life. Safety. Shelter. Food or friendship.
and noticing the effect that has on the mind. You might notice a sense of ease coming into the body as it softens more fully into this present moment. Or perhaps a release of some tension, maybe manifesting in the shoulders or the tummy. The releasing of any distracting or harmful thoughts as you incline your mind to the beautiful. And the invitation I'd like to make is for you to keep on infusing your awareness with a sense of gratitude and appreciation, kindness, acceptance, care, towards whatever arises in the present moment for you. You may wish to suffuse your whole body part by part with this kind, appreciative awareness. Or if your mind is already fairly quiet, you might notice the breath very naturally, gently flowing in and flowing out. without choosing or preferencing one experience or object for another. Just keep on noticing the way you're relating to whatever comes to mind.
as your mind quietens, you may start to appreciate some space between the thoughts. As you move further from language into experience, if you notice that silence, treat her very gently like a very precious friend without trying to make her stay or without feeling afraid but just softening and opening to the silence in the mind. And if the breath comes to visit, noticing that the breath too is very delicate and needs a gentle touch. Like a bird, if you hold that little bird too tightly, it gets crushed too loosely and it flies away. So if the breath comes to you, just see what kind of holding it needs. As though you're gently holding hands with the breath, flowing along with it. Without controlling just befriending and enjoying the company of the breath. Always moving inward to the centre of this moment. Finding deeper contentment with where you are now.
So we're coming towards the end of the short meditation. And I just invite you to again go through the body with the mind, allowing this appreciative, kind awareness to soak through every cell. And just notice how your body feels now. Perhaps giving special attention to the body, particularly any areas which may be unwell or weak just in need of your care and attention. Recognizing the amazing miracle of life and all that this body does for us. Feeling this vitality, maybe tingling in the cells and sending it some love. May this being be happy. May I be well. May I be safe. May I be at peace. And staying connected to any pleasant tone, feeling tone in the body or peace and well-being in the mind. Allowing those thoughts to radiate out to everybody who's sitting here together. May we all be happy. May we all be well. May we all be safe. May we live a peace. Feeling that connection between your own heart and everyone gathered here together. And just dwelling in that feeling. So I'll ring the bell three times and at the end of the third ring, if you wish, you can gently open your eyes. I think another couple of people joined us there towards the end, so warm welcome, Michael, and uh, I'm not sure who else just joined, but you're very welcome. 
you got at least a couple of minutes of quiet. I think Gunther just arrived, yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Gunther. I, I, I thought it started at 7.30. Ah, uh, it's my sessions that usually start at 7.30. This one's a 7 o'clock session. <laughs> I know it now. <laughs> <laughs> You're here now. That's great. Okay, so... <clears throat> Sometimes I'm reluctant to start talking after a nice meditation. <laughs> okay, bye Mira. Mira's off. I'm glad that people can come just to get whatever it is they need and, and go when they have to go. It's, uh, it's totally fine. One of the advantages, I guess, of being on Zoom is that there aren't any doors to open or close, so we don't really disturb each other. We just sort of appear and disappear. It's very dumbic. <laughs> We don't understand the cause, this is the bit that's missing, but we know about the arising and passing. <laughs> so yeah, so today I wanted to talk a little bit more about mindfulness and not hopefully in a prescriptive or technical way, but more in the sense of how to deepen and, and turn up the wattage on mindfulness, so turn up the lights of the mind, so to speak. And um, last week we already discussed um, the basic idea of mindfulness and I used one of Bhikkhu Bodhi's quotes which I really like as a definition and he says something along the lines of um, mindfulness is that aspect of the mind which brings the content of the present moment into focus and sustains that focus for long enough to the experience to open to wisdom or for wisdom to arise, let's say. And this is very nice, uh, because it focuses on, you know, the aspect of mindfulness that is presence, that is really rooted in the present moment. And another um, definition that's often used is this idea of bare awareness. Bhikkhu Bodhi says, free from cognitive clutter, but bare awareness also means free from the five hindrances. So one of the functions of mindfulness is to slowly and gradually, through wisdom and through that awareness, overcome these five hindrances so that we really do have the capacity and the strength of mind to start penetrating into the seeing things as they really are. Another aspect of mindfulness is that it guards the mind from the unwholesome states entering. It enables us to abandon the unwholesome and to maintain and cultivate the wholesome. So it has a protective function. Mindfulness can be likened sometimes to a gatekeeper. Many times in the Buddhist texts, the Buddha talks about mindfulness as a gatekeeper that keeps the enemies out and keeps the friends in. So again, this implies some wisdom. We have to know who the friends are, who the enemies are, and don't allow the wrong ones in. <laughs> but um, one aspect of mindfulness that I love is this aspect of care and kindness, which really should flow along with the way that we're aware. It's the second factor of the noble path, what the Buddha called right intention, or right, um, how else is it described? Right intention, right uh, thought sometimes. Um, and my teacher, Ajahn Brown, calls it right motivation. Um, and these are the right intentions of loving kindness, of compassion, and of making peace or letting go, yeah? rather than sense desire, um, sort of violence or cruelty, you know, in the way that we can be aware, sometimes a little bit too forcefully. Um, and the opposite of this making peace and letting go is kind of holding on, grasping, um, and not being willing to let go or fighting with whatever's arising, yeah? So letting go is also something that I should probably qualify. It's not so much about getting rid of anything in our experience, it's more about making peace with what's arising. So it carries an aspect of patience with it. It actually carries... It's a very similar to letting be, letting things be. And when we really open up and let things into our heart, we find they generally calm down. It's as though those like unwanted states are kind of little beings in need of some care and attention and some love. And when they get what they need, they actually kind of curl up and go to sleep. But if we do it in order for that to happen, it doesn't work. That's kind of like making a deal with the mind. And um, yeah, the mind's just too clever for that. <laughs> so it's, uh, it carries a lot of skillfulness in, in mindfulness itself. Um, and it's never separate from this aspect of care 
um, the aspect of ethical ethics as well, and also wisdom. Yeah. And the last thing that I'll just um, recap from last time is that mindfulness is directed into particular areas. So it's not just like, let's be mindful, let's be fully aware of like eating chocolate just to get more enjoyment from the chocolate. I mean, you can do that if you want, and that's okay, especially if it's not chocolate, but it's like nature or it's like listening to somebody deeply. This is, you know, wholesome ways to be more fully present. But the idea of mindfulness in the Buddhist context, right mindfulness, is directed onto certain areas of existence, which are called the four satipatthanas. So they're the, area, the aspects of the body. Yeah? We direct mindfulness to our body and then to our feelings, sensations, experiences within that body. Um, or sensations and feelings in the mind. And also um, being aware of mind itself, various mental states and how they arise. And the last satipatthana is um, <clears throat> being aware of dhamma. And it doesn't mean in this case like the dhamma. It means um, various uh, contents of the mind, in particular the five hindrances and the seven awakening factors. So don't worry, you don't have to remember all this, but the point is that mindfulness in Buddhism, as opposed to maybe the modern mindfulness movement, is that it's directed onto certain areas, because they're the areas where we tend to assume a self, an abiding self exists in in one or many or a combination of those things, yeah. We take ourselves to be our body, we take ourselves to be our mind, our moods, our perceptions, etc. Hmm? So mindfulness directed there starts to uncover this nature, the true nature of impermanence, of suffering, or unsatisfactoriness if you prefer, and um, a non-self. Yeah, not that there's nothing there but that what we take to be a self is not really worthy of that designation. <clears throat> so today, as I said, I wanted to talk about what can help to empower, to increase that mindfulness and really um, make it more penetrative and able to direct its beam, so to speak, on those areas. And uh, the first one that comes to mind is actually joy. And joy is something that's not often talked about in the meditation, or at least perhaps not as much as it could be. Um, and when we're talking about joy, we're talking about a wholesome kind of joy, which is more peaceful and uplifting rather than exciting to the senses. You know, it's not an agitating or an exciting kind of um, sensual pleasure. It's more um, an uplift, something calming, serene. So yesterday, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we had our Vesak celebration, and this is um, a time to recollect the Buddha and his life, and of course his teachings, yeah, and to try and renew our commitment and uh, motivation to apply those teachings. This is the best way, the Buddha said, to actually venerate and honour and respect him. And uh, confidence that can arise through reflecting on the teachings, reflecting on the Buddha's life and on our own potential for awakening is the uh, proximate cause for joy. <laughs> so all these things are always related in a sequence of cause and effect. And it was very obvious yesterday as we went through the day, you know, just appreciating our good fortune to have found a meaningful path, a path that actually has this taste of freedom, yeah, and feeling like a sense of trust, a sense of confidence. Maybe if you're not a Buddhist, it might not be in the Buddha himself, but a sense of confidence in kindness, in compassion, in virtue. And even a sense of confidence in oneself, you know, that we have the capacity to put these teachings in practice to a greater or lesser extent. I mean, it's helpful not to measure, and I think this is something, you know, we all do, and I still do. But the fact is that every time we incline our mind towards the Dhamma, towards the end of suffering, we're actually taking a step on the path. And I can't resist again quoting Bhikkhu Bodhi because he has this lovely, uh, inspiring little phrase and he says there's only two things you need to achieve enlightenment. One is to start walking on the path and the other is to continue. And I just find that so lovely because it sort of implies that no step goes waste. And the only way we really sort of uh, 
I don't know, can you take a backward step? I tend to feel that we can go a little bit off track for a while, but once you've heard these teachings and you've recognised the problem, I think we come back to them again and again. Because it's so practical, it's so um, easily, under, uh, what's the word that the Buddha uses? It's, it's observable, it's experienced here and now. You know, that when we have craving, when we have wanting, there's a lack of contentment. We suffer at that moment. You know, when we're content, when we're satisfied and fully present in the now, at that moment, a huge heap of suffering has gone, has passed away. You know, and we can keep on coming back to this again and again. The suffering is there, but suffering has a cause. And what a relief, you know, to know that suffering has a cause so that we can start to take steps to uh, eradicate that cause and change the course of our lives. So yesterday was very powerful in this way for me and for many people, I think, just to remember um, the good fortune that we have for having found a path that gives our life some real meaning and a sense of purpose, a sense of a way beyond all this suffering, sickness, old age and death. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I think that can be really helpful for um, engendering this sense of joy is obviously living a life of sila, living a life of virtue. And in this sequence that we looked at yesterday, the proximate cause for virtue is also this confidence. So they're all kind of leading on from one another, you know, they sort of circle around each other and reinforce each other as well. But um, virtue and living, you know, a life of goodness, a life of kindness and generosity is a very beautiful and conducive thing for the heart, you know, to arise, this, to arouse joy. And um, the Buddha referred to the kind of joy that arises through living a virtuous life as blameless bliss. Yeah, and I think... Because he often speaks in negatives, like blameless, okay, so I don't feel remorse, but is that really happiness, or is that just a lack of remorse? But it's not only an absence. There's actually something that a lack of remorse gives you. There's some kind of sense of, yes, I'm on the right track, like I have a clear conscience, I can feel good about myself, I can go to sleep feeling that I did my best. You know, I'm not perfect, but... I've pretty much tried my best, given the conditions that I'm presented with, given the information at hand, I've made the best decisions that I can. And um, there's something very beautiful about reflecting on that, which is why I started off the meditation by actually not directly focusing on our goodness, but on gratitude in general mm -hmm. towards others and towards the kindness that does exist in the world. Because the Buddha said, think about this, reflect on it, and that actually increases the sense of joy. Today also, um, I had this lovely chat with two of the nuns in uh, Dhammasara, where I was, uh, was going to say trained. I went there after I lived in Burma, so it was my second kind of base monastery. And uh, I still have a very close friend there. And then this other nun, who's a really beautiful, kind-hearted nun, she's 78 years old, she just happened to hop into the Skype call. She's not used to this technology stuff. Um, and it was just so beautiful to see these two beaming faces, and we were talking about the Dhamma and catching up, and it kind of turned into something of a mutual appreciation club where I was saying, wow, you look so radiant, you know, you have such a kind heart, and she was saying, you're doing really well, and, and then the other nun was saying, yeah, we're really good friends, you know, we support each other a lot. And by the end of this conversation, I was so roused up, you know, full, full with happiness and gladness, and that really energised me, it energised mindfulness, it energised my mind. I'd love to be able to tell you that I then went to sit and meditate and, you know, the mindfulness was really powerful, but I actually had another phone call, so I couldn't put that straight into my sitting meditation. But one trick that I really do love to do is to do these kind of practices in the day, you know, reflecting on the goodness of my life, not out of a sense of ego, but just the, the beauty of kindness, either received or performed, yeah? It doesn't really matter which way it goes. And also, one of the other things I like to do quite a lot of is metta meditation. And I find that metta meditation is a really great way to start, obviously, undermining hindrances like ill will, 
maybe even just slight irritation or slight kind of not feeling quite well, not feeling quite settled. And so I practice this metta and it starts to arouse the joy. And really joy does translate to energy. Energy and joy are almost, you know, two sides of the same coin. When you're joyful, there's a lot of energy, brightness in the mind. And when you have a lot of energy, you enjoy life, right? Everything looks brighter, feels nicer. You know, the little breeze that passes your cheek feels really delightful because you're energised, you know. And so uh, the metta meditation really helps with that. And I often uh, do some metta, quite a bit of metta in my sitting practice before I then maybe go on to something like the breath. Yeah, because my teacher Ajahn Brahm really talks about the breath as, um, I guess, his sort of special speciality in meditation and also as a teacher. And I used to find it quite difficult to stay with the breath because it didn't seem very interesting. But now I realise my mind just wasn't ready for such a, um, a subtle object. You know, when the mind is too coarse and the mind is still restless and kind of unable to really settle with contentment in the present moment, the breath is just too refined. So I really use these different reflections to develop a sense of contentment. And contentment is something that kind of brings the mind more deeply inward rather than craving and aversion which take the mind outward it, they take it out onto the next thing that I want or the thing that just happened that went wrong you know they're always kind of moving you out away from this present moment and in meditation you can see these forces it's like even if the meditation is going well a little bit of wanting comes up like what next you know or you just feel kind of not quite satisfied with the breath and you start thinking about past things that have happened or fantasizing into the future. So it's always this kind of discontent that kind of blows you off the present moment. Whereas contentment helps you to deepen into that present moment. I think it was a couple of days ago somebody um, wrote a question on one of the live chats and they said, how do I deepen my meditation? And often when people say that, what they really mean is, I want attainments, I want to progress, you know. <laughs> like, tell me how to get more pleasant feeling and get rid of where I am right now. And I just said, well, the best way to deepen your practice is to be more content with where you are. And so, can you see that that's a very different direction? It's not moving outward or onward to something else, to something better it's actually moving more fully into where you are. It's making, it's becoming more intimate with the present moment, with what's arising. And the longer you can stay with that, with that kindness, which helps to almost like glue the mind to its object, you treat it kindly, you care for it, and it creates that intimacy so that gradually the longer the mind stays there, the whole experience opens up, the breath opens up. You know, the Buddha talked about the stages of Anapanasati. You start with noticing, like, is it a short breath or is it a long breath? So you start to see this. I mean, we never know this in daily life, right? We just assume we're breathing, otherwise we'd be dead. Unless you have an asthma attack. I've had quite a few asthma attacks. At that time, the mind gets very sharp with the breath. You're very aware of each breath, and usually the breath is quite short. But the reason that he talks about the long and the short is not because it's important, whether it's long or short, it's just to try and engage the mind and find some interest in the experience. And then he goes on to observing the whole breath, so the whole length of the breath. Yeah? Sometimes people interpret that as the whole um, body of the breath. Actually, it says body of the breath in the Anapanasati Sutta, but some teachers like to say it means the whole body, even. like You can feel the, the whole breath through the whole body. And this can also be helpful if you're not fully ready to be on just a very small area. It's not really a small area, but a subtle object, yeah, because the breath is really very soft and gentle at this point. So you feel the whole breath and you sort of feel it rising, you notice how it kind of comes to fullness and then maybe there's a slight pause and then it slowly subsides. And at that point it's almost like you're riding a wave, you know, on the sea or... Maybe you're on just a lilo and then you're gently floating with the breath. 
Or sometimes I like to use that simile of holding hands with the breath. So you're going along with the breath, yeah? Wherever you go, the breath comes. And it's a, an attitude of friendship that you're having. You don't grasp the hand of it, you know, really tightly. You just hold the hand of the breath very gently and, and be its friend. And if it wants to go, let it go. Don't kind of keep on dragging it back into a mind that's not prepared. So it's really important to prepare this mind with um, kindness, with some joy, with some energy before we go on to things like the breath. And then at some point the breath starts to calm. Again, the more calm your mind, the more calm the object becomes. And the next stage, which is the pivotal point really in breath meditation, is when the joy starts to arise with the breath. And again, this happens because we're being present, because we're just letting go of some of the um, energy of the doer, the one that wants to control, the one that wants to make it happen. Yeah? This is a way of speaking that I also picked up from Ajahn Brahm and find really helpful. He says that the energy starts to flow more into the knowing, or the knower, if you want. But the knowing and the knower, it's not a person, it's not a thing. It's just this passive awareness, so this sense of knowing becomes empowered and the doing, interfering, manipulative mind starts to subside. So the more energy that goes into the knowing, the clearer the object becomes and the brighter and stronger the mindfulness becomes. So the breath actually starts to look captivating to the mind and it keeps the mind with it for long periods without any force. Yeah, this is really important because when you use too much force, you know, tension arises and, you know, the, you develop kind of not a very nice relationship with breath meditation. I think I had not much success with it for years, actually, when the instruction was just to kind of keep on bringing the mind back again and again and again. But this idea of preparing the mind and putting joy into the mind and energy and remaining content with whatever was arising in the present really helped me to start to see and settle with the breath and stay with the breath for longer. And it's really interesting at a certain point that the more you let go, the more this joy just starts to take over. And if there's any sort of sense of self that comes into it at that time, even just the idea, like a little commentary, like, ooh, or... What next? Like any sort of leaning in and the joy will just recede. <laughs> I don't know if other people have had this experience, but it's so interesting when this is happening, you know, and you really see how this sense of self keeps getting in, in the way of a process, of the natural process of the Dhamma unfolding. So I want to wind up soon, so give us some time for a discussion, but I just wanted to end with a little quote from my teacher, um, which I think explains really what I've been trying to say about just staying present quietly and waiting. So he says, this is about breath meditation, particularly at the stage before the joy starts to arise. So he says, in the early hours of the morning, it's only a matter of time until the horizon glows with the first light of day. Just as when you remain still with the calm breath, it's only a matter of time until joy and happiness appear in your mind. Mental energy flowing into the knower makes mindfulness full of power and energised mindfulness is experienced as piti sukha, happiness and joy. So... Of course, there's more beyond there, but at this point, one can really start to see that the mindfulness is becoming bright, is becoming strong. And because of that, you start to be able to see a little bit more deeply into this cause of suffering, into what you know helps to remove the cause and how it feels to start developing a different kind of happiness. So we start to develop wisdom, and the stronger the stillness, the stronger the wisdom that arises as a, as a result of that stillness. So remember that it starts with joy, and there's many, many places in the suttas which I could quote, which show a kind of natural sequence of progression through the meditation, and again and again and again it starts with confidence, it starts with virtue, it starts with contentment and joy, 
with gratitude, generosity, inspiration, all these wholesome kind of happinesses that rather than agitating the mind and stimulating the senses, actually uplift the heart and calm the mind. Yeah? So... <clears throat>